start the meeting with the Pledge of Allegiance, and Michael Maples, who is a veteran, is going to lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. Uh, no, okay. Uh, I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Uh, I forgot to introduce myself. I'm Jeannie Gautreaux, district captain. And we have Mary Cook, who's another district captain. And Susan Ohms, who's another district captain. And um, thank you all for coming. We have a lot to cover tonight, but Gary is going to say a prayer, and then we will have the introduction. Hi, I'm Gary. All right. God, our Father, giver of life. We entrust the United States of America to your loving care. You are the rock upon which this nation was founded. You alone are the true source of our cherished rights to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Reclaim this land for your glory and dwell among your people. Send your spirit to touch the hearts of our nation's leaders. Open their minds to the great worth of human life and the responsibilities that accompany human freedom. Remind your people that true happiness is rooted in seeking and doing your will. Amen. 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 Thanks, Gary. That was nice. Um, okay, so I might forget. If anyone really needs to know more about Article 5, and you do, we have two copy guides, but we need to be prepared because a lot of people want to make it sound like, you know, we, we know what I'm I need one, please. Okay. Okay. Um, okay. I was just, who, who wants one? Do you need one? Okay. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. It's all above the table. Because yeah. okay. people are going to say, oh, the convention is never going to happen. You're trying to change the Constitution. So anyway, I've had to read it many times. Um, the other thing is, um, since our primary goal is to get to conventions, which may happen soon or it may not happen at all, in the meanwhile, the reason that we're here is because we need to get involved in local politics. Um, and JC, our legislative liaison, is going to tell you why it's important. Because next year, hopefully, y'all will all be able to go to the Capitol to actually watch it in person. And we, we'd like to let our legislators know that we exist. Um, so we're going to start preparing for next year's legislation because a couple of bills that the Convention of State supports got, okay? So they're going to resurrect those bills. So we're trying to get ready for that. So we need a lot of help with that. And then Dale Clary, an attorney, also is on the election and equity commission. commission. And he's going to talk about the results of that meeting, which happened very recently. So there's a lot to cover. And then we're going to have a question and answer after that. And we have to be out here by 8 o'clock. But hopefully we'll have time to cover to cover all our materials. So again, thank y'all for coming. As a layperson, going to the Capitol is really cool. If you haven't ever been it there is. before to listen to stuff, I actually got to interview quite a few different people at the Capitol. And I just they didn't Yes, you did. Yeah, yeah. A lot of representatives yeah. and yeah. yes. It was cool. So it was. All right, so uh, I want to thank everybody for coming. Um, so the question is, why COS? So why are you here? And well, it's a great team rooted, uh, led by folks rooted in understanding, without God, we the people will lose this great country. One of the, one of the things I had looked at when I had started, uh, when I retired, was uh, during my working years, but I was probably like most people, I didn't have time to get involved in anything but work. So. You know, being married with four kids and a job and working 100 hours a week, you didn't really have time to, to get involved. So I can understand a lot of people not wanting to get involved because, you know, once you get involved, if you really want to get involved, it's going to take some energy. Well, the great thing about Convention of States is you don't have to use all your energy because if, if you get involved from a volunteer standpoint, we have a great website 
and you can go to their website and just kind of keep informed whenever, whenever your uh, time allows. So you don't have to be in the middle of everything. Now, we've got a great team that, that looks at a lot of stuff, and I'm on a team that looks at a lot of bills. The fact is, we looked at almost all the bills in the legislature, and that was almost 2,000 bills filed. Now, we're not going to cover 2,000 bills tonight, so don't get too worried. <laughs> Normally he does. But, but the other great thing about Convention of States is we've got some great partners. We got the, we got the Patriot Academy, Wall Builders, uh, Foundations for Freedom. These are, these are great people, and they're all rooted in the good Lord. And if we're going to save this country, we've got to start with the right premise. We have to start with the good Lord. If you don't... You know, the, all the stuff that's going on in this country, they're not going to fix it because they're approaching it from the wrong angle. You're not going to fix this country by passing bills that make we're laws. You're going to fix this country by obeying the 10 laws that were given to us Amen. on Mount Sinai. And that's the key to the, the, this country. And I don't care what bills they pass in Congress, until they get back to that, they're not going to succeed. They can pass all the bills they want. Because they can pass bills that say people that, you know, only a law-abiding people will obey the bills. You know, the criminals are not going to obey the bills. And they don't understand that. And you can listen to people on the radio and they talk in circles. And if you want, and so if you want to waste, if you want to waste your energy, listen to these people, these people talking in circles, or you can get involved with a cause that has a direction. Now, what's our resolution? Well, to go to the Convention of States, we need 34 states to get on board. They have, we have to pass, the 34 states have to call, have to pass a resolution. It has to go through the House and the Senate, and it has to be worded exactly the same. That's critical. So we, so you had to put, the, we had to write the three things that we wanted to do. So, if, you've, if you're a volunteer and, uh, and, and, I, and I vetted you, the big question is, what is the three goals of Convention of States? Because if you're going to be involved with the organization, you ought to know what the goals are. You know, so somebody says, why are you with Convention of States? I don't know, my buddy told me to sign the paper and I signed it and I went home. Well, that's great. You know, we like people that sign the petition. But we really like people to say, why you signed, why you signed the petition? You signed the petition because you, you wanted to impose fiscal restraints on the federal government. You don't think that 30 something, 30 something trillion dollars deficit is something that the country can survive with. You know, when I was, when I was in school, I remember Reagan took the, the, had the first bill that was over a trillion dollars. That was a big deal. You know, the, the news media came unglued. Can you imagine a trillion dollar bill? Now we talk about a trillion dollar bill like it's nothing. You know? So one day the bill is going to come to you, and people say, "Well, it's not going to come to you." Well, have you have you looked at your grocery bill and your tax bill and your and your gas bill and stuff like that? The bill's coming due. It's called inflation, because your money is going to be worth less, and that's how we get. That's how you're going to pay this back. Now you're going to pay it back some other ways too, but right now that's a focus. The other thing is, we want to limit the power of the federal government. Now we've had some great news in the last couple of weeks. Some great news. We've got the Supreme Court has ruled on a bunch of cases that if you can't get excited about some of these cases that are pulling back the federal government, then you haven't been watching the right broadcast. Fact is, if anything, if, you, if you're watching liberal broadcasts, you can understand why you ought to get excited because they're coming unglued. And if you like me, the more they come unglued, the better you feel. The fact is, I walk away with the biggest smile after watching some of this stuff. You know, I want them to come unglued. They deserve to come unglued. After what they've done to my country, I want them to come unglued. Limit the, limit the terms of, the, of, the, of Congress. They've got people in Congress that have been in Congress for over 30 years. Some of them almost 40 years. I think the record right now is 47 years. Uh, <laughs> Actually, I know about Biden. Think about this. Biden gets elected when he's 26 years old. Or I think it was 26. Anyway, he gets elected. And he gets elected not to the House. He gets elected to the Senate. 
Now that's a big deal to get elected to the Senate, yes. right? And what is his first position in the Senate? A lot of people don't know this. He is put on the Judiciary Committee, where he is, will be in charge of vetting Supreme Court justices, <laughs> right? But what is his position on the Judiciary Committee? As a freshman senator, he is put as the chair of the Judiciary Committee. How many people knew that? No. You knew that? Yes. Now, if that doesn't set a flag, I mean, now he's the president. But the fact that a freshman, a junior senator would be in charge of the Senate Committee that is going to vet Supreme Court justices, you can understand why he is so upset right now. Because if you watch the hearing with Clarence Thomas, yes. when they tried to ra take Ter Clarence Thomas off of the Supreme Court, you can understand why Biden is coming in blue right now. And if you like me, I smile, my smile gets bigger every time he gets more unglued. Now, Convention of States needs 34 states to call a convention. Right now, we've had a great year. We've had four states sign on this year. We've got three states that we think we may, we may get on this year. We've got North Carolina, who actually, if the commit uh, uh, almost cleared the Senate, got held up in the Senate by, by one senator. We have Pennsylvania and Ohio, and we even have Massachusetts now is actually come on board. Wow. Now, we lost five states this year that, that Mark Meckler, our president, thought we might get on board with. Those five states are the ones in, in the, the ones in blue. Um, we lost New Hampshire, South Dakota, Wyoming, Virginia, and Kansas, only because the, legisla le the legislative session ran out. Those states are keyed up for next year. There is a very good chance we will get those five states next year. Very good chance. And there's a, so there's a good chance that we may get one or two sta states this year. So we, we were hoping to end up with 20, 21 states. I mean, 22 would be awesome, and that's not unreal. And if you add the five states for next year, we're going to be in the mid-20s, maybe the high 20s in a year or two from now. Now, can you imagine what will happen with the news media when we get close to 30 states? If you're familiar, if you're familiar with the American Constitutional Society, that is a group that is fighting convention of states to the nail. That group is led by Senator Feinstein. Well, I'm sorry, he's not a senator anymore. By Russ Feinstein. If you know anything about Russ Feinstein, he was a senator out of Minnesota, um, uh, Wisconsin. And he, he actually got taken out by Ron Johnson, who is a great senator, right? So th that was exciting. Senator Fe uh, Feinberg, huh? Feingold. Russ Feingold. He's the president of the American Constitutional Society. He was actually on ES, um, on NPR this, this last week, beating on Convention of States for an hour. And after listening to him beat on Convention of States for an hour, I just felt more emboldened to continue on and keep working, and I will make every meeting you got, and I will talk about why the great group this is. Because what he did there in that one hour, you got, if you don't understand what Convention of the States is and you listen to that kind of stuff, you, you'll understand why you want to be more involved in Convention of the States. What's his primary uh, criticism? What's that? What's his primary criticism? His primary criticism, we're going to rewrite the Constitution. Like a runaway convention? A runaway convention, and not only that, it's led by some ultra-conservatives. Oh, Ultra conservatives that want to destroy the Constitution. No, they, they, he's not going to say anything about the fact that the original Constitution, which is 28 pages long, is now 3,000 pages long. <coughs> that doesn't bother him. The, it doesn't bother him that Article 1, Section 8, that says what Congress can do, that went from eight lines of code, is now 200 and something pages. That doesn't bother him. Right? So, yes. If you listen to that one hour conversation, it was great to listen to that. And my wife says, why are you listening to that? I said, you know one thing, I, I think it was on the Godfather when he said, know your, be close to your, to, to, to your friends, but closer to your enemies. You need to understand what's out there. There's a lot of stuff going on. All right, so Louisiana resolution was passed. So what do we need to do? 
right? It's passed. We don't have to do anything. Well, we want to ensure that it never gets repealed. Now, you can rem remember, we got 34 states we got to get to. As we get close to 34 states, we got to get the, the rest of the states on. But you also don't want to lose any. And just as easily as the resolution got passed through the House and the Senate, a senator or a representative can file a bill and say, Louisiana does not want to be one of the convention of states de of delegates. It's a bill. And it can get sent, you know, there's nothing magic about it. They can, and I guarantee as we get closer to the convention, there'll be bills filed. And we want to stay informed if a bill gets filed. And we want to make sure that that bill gets what the proper attention. Jesse? Yeah. Could that be buried in an amendment to a bill? I don't think so. I think it has to be a, a the bond of standing is, and Dale may correct me on that, but I think it has to be that resolution would have to be killed. So it would have to, it have to be, I think it's a pretty, pretty much it would have to be standalone. I don't see it getting done. Work with our legislature to prepare for the Constitutional Convention per Article 5, right? And make a strong grassroots team worthy of amendments to be proposed and ratified. Remember, we have three guidelines, but we don't have a constitution. We don't have anything that says what the words are going to be to the bill. Now, one of the things I wanted, one of my big things is, besides what's pretty, uh, what was covered, is I want to do away with the 17th Amendment. Amen. The 17th Amendment said that we will go to popular elections for the uh, senators. Now, that sounded good. But that wasn't the purpose of the 17th Amendment. The pur I mean the pre-17th Amendment. The, 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 we're a representative government. We want to be representative by our legislature and our, so our, 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 rep our, our representatives needed to select our senator because they were the ones closest to what the bills in Louisiana were and what the exact purpose of sending a senator to represent the state was. So they were the ones to select the Senate. You know, how many of y'all are, are thrilled with what Cass, uh, Senator Cassidy is doing right now? <laughs> how many people would like to uh, um, every day, huh? How many people would like to impeach him? Yeah. How, how does he get impeached? He, but he gets in, No, he can, he can impeach. He's got to get impeached by the senators of uh, impeaching him. So his teammates are got to impeach him. Now what's the odds of that happen? Pretty close to zero, right? Yeah, I, I, I can't imagine what he'd have to do to get impeached. Now, what if, it, if the 17th Amendment wasn't passed? Then the legislature could take him off. And how would they do that? Well, we the people would then call the legislator and say, I don't like what he's doing. I want, all, I want, you, I want him out. So we the people have direct re representation to take him out. We don't have to wait six years. And I guarantee you those senators would pay more attention to us. They don't have to pay attention to this right now. The only time they have to pay attention is the year before they get elected. Yep. You know, you listen to what he said the year before you got elected. He was like, wait, wait, is this the same guy that we had in there five years before? Yes, yeah, the same guy, except it was an election year. And what's the next thing? In the interim, we want to work with our legislators to push back against the federal government. The federal government never existed when the, when, the United, when, the, when the colonies were, were here. There were 13 original colonies. There wasn't, a, there wasn't a United States of America. And the United States of America was formed by the colonies. So the colonies in the Constitution maintained that sovereignty. Now you, you go to Baton Rouge and you tell some of the legislators that and they look at you like you're crazy. I said, have you read the Constitution? You have power. Now you don't use it because, you know, because you've given it up. But what we want to do is we want them to, we want them, we want them to take that power back. And to do that, there are certain bills that need to get filed. So one of the things that we did last year is that we were concerned, I think a lot of people were concerned with the election, 2020. Now, I don't, know, I don't know exactly to what degree there was fraud in the election, but to say there was no fraud in the election is a bridge too far. There was some fraud in the election. I think everybody, would, uh, most people with any sense would agree to that. 
There was a big flag that was set election night. If you were awake as I was at 2 o'clock in the morning on election night and saw six states shut down counting, that's never been done before, and you don't question that and say, what the heck's going on here? You know? And Trump's winning by 700,000 votes in Pennsylvania. Wow. That is unreal. And then you look and you go, so why did the other, why did the other five states shut down counting? Why did all these states shut down counting at the same time? Now, you know, you look at information and you look at data and you say, well, it could be that these six states and these 82 electoral votes might be something that somebody might want. And if they couldn't get to that point because of the way the election had turned, maybe we need to reevaluate our position. There's a lot of maybes, of course. But the fact that Trump had was 700 votes ahead in Pennsylvania was something that was a bridge too far for anybody because to believe that you want to win Pennsylvania and stop Trump from getting elected, there's two states that were critical to Trump not being president. Those two states were Pennsylvania and Georgia. That's 36 electoral votes. Now all you need is two more to guarantee Biden's election. Now if you're, if you're a gambler, you want to say, well, I don't want to just, I, I want to make sure he wins. Then if I can uh, stack six votes, uh, six states against him, I can guarantee he wins. I don't care how many votes you'll take. Because I can turn out what I need. Especially when you look at the fact that Georgia doesn't stop counting votes until five, until what was six o'clock Friday, three, four days after the election's over with. Now that's a lot of stuff that if you you know that you can question. So what so what do we do in Louisiana? Well, we said you know this uh, kind of bothers us, so we formed a convention of states along with a lot of good people, and uh, I don't know if you know Susan. She has a great team called Louisiana. Um, Louisiana Sunshine. Louisiana Sunshine. So we've teamed up with Louisiana Sunshine and some other great groups, and we worked on some bills. Uh, the, the original bills that came out of the House, we, didn't, we weren't happy with, but we got uh, 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 Hodges' bill was the first one, right? On 837, yeah. uh, the House Health and Welfare Committee. <laughs> so we had like three or four bills that were working its way through. We finally ended up with... Set, now, the Republican women in, in, in St. Tammany were the ones that lit the fuse. Because they went to a meeting and they told Senator Hewlett uh, basically that they didn't like the bills and they wanted her to get on board. So Senator Hewlett took that information and she went to another meeting in Baton Rouge and the, the Republican women up in Baton Rouge uh, kind of also gave her a mouthful. <laughs> So, so these, uh, these uh, mama bears got her attention and she got with the house and we got together and after a few iterations we ended up with Bill 221 and it was signed by the governor and it became Act 480. In fact, that, that Act 480 said that the RFQ out for the Dominion voting machines will get pulled because they don't meet the new bill that was set by the Louisiana legislature. So they formed a committee. And the committee is up on the screen. Is that my cue, JC? And uh, what? That's, your, cue? that's your cue. Right. So this man right here was placed on the committee, and I'm proud to introduce that man to you right now. And we're great. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, oh. <laughs> Sorry about that. Yeah, let me get that thing out your pocket. Thank you, JC. Um, JC knows leg this JC and Susie know more about legislation than, than anybody that I know of. They help keep us in track and, and, and online as to what's going on in the legislature. And JC has more detailed charts than you can shake a stick at. 
And it's like he makes our head spin when he puts all this together. But he, these two people know their stuff. And so I'm, I'm honored to actually be involved with them in the legislative committee. Um, but last year, in 2021, the Voting System Commission was created by the legislature. Thank you, Senator Sharon Hewitt <clears throat> from here on the North Shore. And thank, <clears throat> excuse me, and thank you to Kyle Erdogan, who also cooperated with her, the Secretary of State, to get this thing uh, passed. So all the commission did, and let me unplug here and move over to the other one. But all the commission really had the authority, legal authority to do was to make recommendations. Act 480. All it could do was make, all the commission could do was make recommendations to the Secretary of State uh, for the purpose that we were formed to create and evaluate and recommend the type of voting system that was going to be procured. There's more details in the statute, but we're going to a paper ballot, folks. And that's what the statute says. And I'm going to skim through this. It says we're going to have a paper document or a secure hand-marked paper ballot shall be printed on individual sheets of paper. Uh, the hand-marked paper ballots may be used for in-person and early voting. Um, they're going to be secure, which means you're going to have all kind of um, protections in the paper so that it can't be forged. And it's going to be paper, obviously. And it shall produce an auditable voter verified paper record, which we've never had in Louisiana. The only audit that we have right now is, except for the, the paper ballots when they come in by early, by mail voting, the only audit we right have right now is you're going to look in the back of the machine and see what the back of the machine spits out. There's nothing from when the front of the machine where you go in and tap, tap, tap and put in your vote. There's nothing that says that what comes out the back of the machine is the same thing the people put in the front of the machine. So we're going to paper and paper, good news, is going to be the official ballot. Um, now the commission met and finished its recommendations just last week. See, all of the first ones to get all this. Um, we, there was only a few things that we actually had authority to do. Um, but, uh, and I'll give you that in a minute. But I'm going to give you a couple of clips from what, what happened last week. This is straight from the Voting System Commission meetings. The first one, let me give you a setup here. The first one is a video of, that's Kyle Ardwan, Secretary of State, who I've got to give a lot of credit to. I mean, he ran this thing well. He's listened to everybody. He brought a lot of experts in. We've been meeting for about eight months. He's been bringing experts in from all across the country, including from Florida, Utah, people who were involved in some of the litigation in Pennsylvania and Atlanta and Arizona. I mean, he brought a lot of really good folks in with diverse opinions about what's going on. And here is Kyle Ardwan questioning, this is last week, these are the Dominion voting machine representatives. Keep in mind, Dominion is, is, the, is where we have all of our voting machines now. We're renting them. And frankly, our, our machines have just gotten old. And we just haven't bought new machines. And Kyle Ardwin has been trying to buy new machines for two years. And everybody's going, wait a minute, we, we don't want to do what we've been doing in the past. And frankly, and to his credit, all he had the authority to do before was electronic voting machines. With Act 480, they changed that and went to paper. Uh, or loud paper at least. So now he had the authority to go look at something other than, come on in, uh, other than uh, simply the electronic voting machines. So Kyle Ardwain is questioning these guys last week. He's going to talk about a court case in Georgia. There's a lot of litigation going on in Georgia rising out of the, the uh, 2020 election and regarding some of the problems in the voting machines. There, you'll hear this uh, discussion about a Halderman report. There's an expert by a guy named, uh, by the name of Alex Haldeman, who actually came and testified to us last year, who basically said there are vulnerabilities in the Dominion voting machines, the very ones that we're using. And Kyle, if I can call him that, is mad because Dominion knew about it, the judges in the litigation knew about it, everybody who has the report knew about it, and the federal judge in Georgia sealed the report and wouldn't let Kyle have it. And he's going, we're about to have an election on these machines. You know there's vulnerabilities. Give me the report. And they wouldn't do it. Um, he's also going to talk a little. This is only about a two-minute. It's important to note, too, that Kyle is the president of the Assessors Association. Of the Secretary of State's Association, Secretary right. Of State's right. Kyle, do it he will also talk about the contract, meaning Louisiana's contract with Dominion says Dominion's going to let us know if they have any problems with their systems. 
And that was legal. That's a law, right? And then legally, we're required to do that. So let me do this. Stem from a, from a, uh, a software standpoint. So, this is Kyle Ardwin in, uh, grilling the Dominion people about why didn't you tell us about the vulnerabilities on our machines. We have an EAC certification. So we have addressed it in, in quite a few versions. So when, when this all came out um, in the court case and before the judge sealed it, uh, were you all aware of the Halderman report at all? I think, to, and I, I can speak to that a little bit, so I'm relatively new, but. But it took a while for even even the company to see that that actual report and then as you can understand prior to the the sys advisory coming out we we weren't allowed to talk about it because it was under seal so it put us in a in a kind of a, a, a difficult position where we weren't allowed to talk about what we could talk to sisa because they were allowed to see the report um and very only a handful of people in the company have even seen the report so but the requirement in the contracts is that you all advise your clients of potential vulnerabilities and we didn't get one I, I, I would have to defer that to the legal um, like where be because because the, you know it's under seal that that makes it I I, I don't have an answer uh, for that uh, today. we uh, can uh, get uh, an answer for uh, that but why from a legal standpoint why we that was not released back. It's my, and, yeah, and this is for my back. discussions with CISA um, and that this is, that is a federal you agency. All were made aware and allow, or the judge allowed you all to see the report. I think in December, correct? I believe that's that's about the time. So, frame. did the judge refuse to allow y'all to alert your clients that there were potential vulnerabilities? That's and us. We're the clients. What's this about it? I'd have to get back to you on that. I, I, that's, that's, now, now we're getting into the, because of the court case and the legal issues. And like I said, I just but, came on board. So I, I, don't, I don't want to speak to something and give you any misinformation. Um, sure. So. Well, and I, I just want to, I want to put on the record this. I sent a letter knowing about the vulnerabilities, asking Dominion to bring in uh, employees, whatever they needed, to come in and inspect these machines, open them up, and show us what the vulnerabilities potentially were, which I thought was a contractual obligation. And you all, and I'm not—I don't mean you. The the CEO of the company tells me to go to a testing lab. Okay, I'll, I'll bring that back as as I appreciate that. Yeah. Mr. Hey, yeah, these are, yeah, honestly, these are clips that, that Michael helped put together. All of this is on the Louisiana Legislature website. Go to the website and look at broadcast archives. Click into the Senate and then click into 2022 and then click into June of 2022 and you'll find Voting System Commission. Yeah, yeah it's, it's a bunch. This meeting alone was seven hours worth of video. And then Michael Fordson was able to do some clips. Here's clip number two. We're only going to do three clips. Clip number two is I'm questioning the, con the, the Dominion people about where do they get their computers from, their computer chips from, and where do they come from, and, and how do we know that what we're getting is secure, and why should we rely on them? And this is, this is you get to hear some of their answers. I say with them, we, t we talked some before, because they actually had a, a vendor display for a couple of days prior to this last meeting, where they came and showed their wares, and really it was a great opportunity to go look at each one of them and actually operate some of the machines. But I got to talk to some of the technical people to find out what they, what they thought about it. I cheated a little bit because I had been talking on Sunday with an expert in the uh, Michigan litigation by the name of St uh, Sean Smith, who is a, a technical cybersecurity expert. And so he, he gave me a few things to ask. Uh, but listen to some of their answers about where the computers come from and what they can do about that. Okay. Um, Mr. Clary, you're first. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. Um, I know we talked some also earlier this week, and I appreciate the conversation. I am, and, and we'll, it's your turn. It's, it's, I've been hitting the other guys, so let's hit you guys as well. I'm looking at a declaration of one of the experts, one of many experts. It's an affidavit, a Lake declaration. There's going on right now in Arizona where they've filed for injunctions to stop the use of electronic voting machines because of cyber insecurity allegations that are in that. And I realize that's a hot topic. I realize it's a controversial topic. One of the things that he has attached to his affidavit is an appendix of the manufacturing locations of most of many of the, well, like, 
many of the digital components that are in those machines. And it's not just you guys. It's ESNS. It's everybody else. It's, it's everybody down the line. And when I look at his list, it's China, 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 China. And that includes Dell. I'm mean, not just you guys and the, the Dell components that are in these machines. How can we be assured that what's coming out of China is something that is not going to infect and not going to impact our voting systems here in Louisiana? Uh, very much like our competitors, we have uh, manufacturing compliance groups that goes through, and certainly, very much like our competitors, we have a manufacturing compliance group that examines each one of the components that we purchase and each one of uh, our uh, manufactured facilities. There are people that stay there all the time, go through all the ma uh, machines, they x-ray the circuit boards. Uh, again, this is a common problem in the industry. Uh, virtually all the electronic components now are made overseas, but we all have the same kind of requirements and the same kind of solutions. You put people in the, the factories, you use uh, buy components from certified manufacturers, you look at the equipment. Um, again, as was mentioned before, as part of the uh, VBSG 2.0 certification, you have to provide a document describing that whole process. So we're doing exactly the same thing. And I understand that, and I, and I appreciate that. And, and I think that's the problem, is that we're, we're using paper to assure security. And I don't, I'm not sure, Mr. Secretary, that that's where we need to be going. At the same time, we know electronic machines are going to be part of and, and will be a part of our lives and part of what we're going to be doing in election system, voting systems as well. I think that's just the hazard that we're dealing with right now. Thank you all very much. Appreciate it. So the answer is we don't have any way of knowing what's coming out of China. It, the, and, and the expert I talked to, Sean Smith, was saying there's four ways that they can infect our, our voting machines. And one of them is to embed chips in the in the uh, in, in the motherboards and in the other uh, digital I'm not an expert on this stuff in the other digital stuff that they're going to be supplying that goes into all these computers and if you don't know what you're looking for you probably won't find it so that that could very be easily be in there you can also put stuff in the voting machine by use of when they because they have to reprogram them for every election and so you take some sort of USB stick stick it in there you can also reprogram them that way. Uh, you can also reprogram a computer wirelessly if you walk past it and know what you're doing. But then even the paper ballot that gets put in, if it has a QR code, can give instructions to the computer as to what to do. So there's lots of ways that, it could, that, that our voting machines can be cheated on uh, with help from people out of China. That's not to say, and even the experts who are in, this, in, the, in the Arizona litigation and the Georgia litigation and the Michigan litigation even say they can be made safe they're not safe yet. They haven't done the work. We're all bringing the stuff in from China. Um, so they're just not secure at this point. Fortunately, we're going to have a paper backup. So whatever the machines say is not official in Louisiana. We'll be able to go actually get the hand, count the hand marked or the machine marked paper ballots, count those, and that'll be the official vote. What other states are doing that? Actually, most states have paper ballots. Over 70% of the votes in, this, in the United States are by paper ballot. But unfortunately, when you walk up to a machine, and that's going to be your choice, we'll talk about that in a minute, most people don't actually look at the paper that sticks, spits out of the machine. We'll talk about that in a minute. We had one more. We had a special visitor show up. So he's got a four minute clip. Come on up, Mr. Lindell. We didn't know he was coming. My pillow guy? Yes. Uh, Mr. Lindell, I'm going to take Chairman's privilege. I'm going to give you a little bit more time since you've come so far. And uh, I know that there's a lot of people that are interested to hear what you have to say. And uh, But I hope you will keep it concise as possible okay. since we have to get to the del deliberation part of this meeting. Okay. Well, thank you, Mr. Secretary and Commissioner members for, ha for allowing me to speak here today. Um, I'm going to start with, um, we're in an apex in history and uh, for Louisiana, for our country, and quite frankly, for the world. Um, we're in a time where computers and artificial intelligence and everything you have that we, uh, as we've gotten into this era and 
when you have cyber attacks or you have um, machines that are defective or, or just computers that make errors, all of that in, the, in my world, in the business world, or my old world, I guess, my business world, um, in the business world, or let's say it's credit card companies, or let's say it's uh, uh, gas lines, um, uh, solar winds a couple years ago, that all, when that happens, you have, you have the text. You just heard the ES&S guys here say all machines are def you know, can be um, de defective or can things happen. Well, when it happens at any other time in business, it's just money. The, good, the bad guys over here, they try and hack in again, and the good guys patch it up, and you see how much it costs you. Insurance companies come in and pay it all. We all suffer maybe with higher prices, but it's just money. When it happens in an election, and it can only happen, if it, just, if it can only just be once, you lose your whole country. And you can ask many other countries, Venezuela, Australia, the list goes on and on. I could sit here and that would be a whole other hour conversation. I want to tell you this, this is uh, when you had ES&S here just a minute ago talking and they said all these things could, could happen. Well, they're not, uh, I know you went after Dominion here. Well. Um, this is something they left out when you asked a question to them, Mr. Secretary. ES&S was forced in, in uh, 10 years ago when they said it, it ties to anybody. They were forced by the DOJ to sell Diable to Dominion in 2010-11. These guys are all tied, the same software, this GEMS. -E but these things, it was what I'm saying is, we're not, we're not, look, you can't, just I'll give you two examples, just this last two months. On May 24th in Georgia, there was an election with Democrats, three Democrats. And this gal and her husband in her own precinct got zero votes. Zero. And now she looked at her husband and said, that, you know, they raised their hand. If they would have got two, you know, they probably wouldn't have had a leg to stand on because you are right. The, the machine companies will not let you see what's inside them. They will not let you. You're not alone here in Louisiana that they didn't have customer service. None of them do. They're all the same. It's horrendous. And we paid as taxpayers for these machines. I will tell you what happened to that gal that had the two, the zero votes. She had zero votes and she raised her hand. This is in Georgia. And I won't even badmouth the worst Secretary of State in the United States, Brad Rassenberg, but he finally said, let's, uh, he finally said, let's, um, let, we better do an audit here. We better do an audit. She got zero. That's a pretty big deviation, zero. And they took, they took apart them, they looked inside the machines. They made the machine company, I won't say their name, but it rhymes with Dominion. They made them look inside the machine. And inside there, guess what? They found 3,762 votes for this lady. This nice gal went from third place to first place. You know what Brad Rassenberger said? There was a programming error in the machines. I want you all to hear what they just said because we now know, don't you guys, don't get tied up in machines being online because they're pre-programmed too. There's many ways. It's a computer you can't see inside. And, and then there was just in Alabama. <laughs> So anyhow, yeah, that was that was just a small part of what he said. Um, so the question is, we now have these electronic voting machines. We're going to be stuck with them. Um, and here's what's going to happen. Here were the recommendations of the committee. I've got a couple. Let me pull this up real quick. All right, so the question, the question is, how are, we going to, how are our voting machines going to work now in the future? And it won't happen this fall because they've got a, a procurement process they have to go through and a regulations writing process they have to go through, but probably by sometime next year. Um, there will be a paper ballot. You, when you walk into the voting precinct, it'll be almost like paper or plastic. Do you want a hand-marked paper ballot or do you want to go vote on a machine? And to some extent, we have to have the machines because there are certain disability voters who can't do a hand-marked paper ballot. So we're going to have some machines to accommodate that, and as we should. There are also going to be some people who want to vote on a machine. They're just used to voting on a machine. And they like doing that. We had some of them come testify to us, and frankly, there's one of them in my family. He wants to go to a machine and do this. 
Um, but then the machine will spit out a piece of paper. Or the other option is you can get your own ballot and you can hand mark it yourself. Either way, you're going to come up with, a, with a, a piece of paper. Then you walk over to a scanner or somebody for the disability people will go bring it to a scanner and you stick it in the scanner and the scanner will look at it and say, okay, you did good, drop it in the box. Or it'll say, look, dummy, you voted four times in the same election, you can't do that. Or you left some out, do you want to vote for those? So it'll audit right there. Um, uh, your vote and then it'll drop it into a box and that'll be the official vote is the paper that comes out of the, the voting process. Um, but I will tell you the vote was seven to four on that first option whether to do hand mark or whether to do a machine. There were four people on the commission who did not want to give you the choice of a hand marked paper ballot. We were that close to being forced to use machines. The counting the vote, the voting face, it's a, the scanner I talked about, the vote was 11 to one. I was the one dissenting vote. Just I knew it was, we were going to lose, but somebody had to stand up and say the machines cannot be trusted, and so I did. Uh, there will be some disabled voter accommodation so that the voters, the, the disabled, can be independent and they can vote confidentially. But that's built into the machines already, and that's really not a uh, not been a question. But what the question is is so what can you do? The first thing you can, you can do now tomorrow contact your clerk of court. This is St. Tammany Parish, and say I want to be an election commissioner and get involved in the process. Find out what it's like to be an election commissioner. It's not that much work. You get a little bit of pay, yeah, 200 bucks maybe, and you'll, go, you'll get some training, and then on the day of election, you'll, go, you'll actually sit there all day. It'll be a long day. But you'll find out what's going on on the inside, and you'll see if there's anything untoward going on on the inside too. So it's a, it's a, we're pushing, the Convention of States is pushing that for as many people to get involved. I signed up in my parish, in Ascension Parish, not long ago. COS is going to do an election integrity coalition. We're still building it up right now that'll do things like support election integrity legislation like the Zuckerbucks bill that we supported this past year. Didn't make it through the legislature, but it will. We're going to get there. Um, to help gather information on election integrity issues in Louisiana, monitor and give input on the voting system machine regulations that Ardwin and his people are working on right now. That'll be a, an opportunity for public comment and all of that. And then we'll work with other organizations to secure the voter rolls. There are several organizations out there doing it already right now. So there will be an opportunity to assist through Convention of States uh, in the near future. So, I mean, there's a lot going on in election integrity, in the election integrity world, and there should have been, and there has been. So I'm, um, we're, JC and I are open to questions. Anything y'all want to talk about? Anything y'all want to ask questions about? Yes, ma'am. I don't have a question, but I have a comment. Um, it, is, it is really crucial to get involved in these types of things. Pick your, pick your battle or your, your subject. I got a phone call from Susie, who hangs out at the Capitol, who said, why don't you come to the redistricting hearing? And I, I was like, oh, it was 8.30 at night, and I was like, well, I don't know. My husband and I own a business. We're behind. And I almost called her back, and I said, I can't, I can't, I can't go. We're so behind at work. And I said, I'm calling. He said, no, you go and you have a good time. I texted our state uh, director and I said, I don't even know what redistricting is about, but I'm going. And she said, well, we'll both learn. And I'm here to tell you, I spent five solid hours without food and water. It was that mesmerizing to learn about redistricting and to watch brave, courageous representatives just blast it away. You didn't stay for the whole thing. You had, wait, am I right, right. Susie? Mm -hmm. every, no, but you and I watched it, and every mm -hmm. word, we were hanging on every word, the testimony, just like when that guy was like, oh, I have to circle back. Well, Stefanski, who was the chairman, asked this guy, Representative Plus, three times, what is your primary motivating factor <laughs> for choosing this precinct, but not this precinct, and they're like, Chairman, uh, 
but when you redistrict, I mean, dancing all around it, okay? He said, you're not answering my question, I'm gonna ask it again. He asked it three times, and finally, Stefanski said, um, are you aware that this precinct is mostly black? And the guy who was like, he, he, he was like, uh, well, chairman, he was trying to make it sound like, that's just an aside, that's an aside issue, and it wasn't. We, everyone knew what it was about because the boundaries were ridiculous and they kept calling it community of interest. Well, Representative Thomas just lambasted that whole thing that it's not about community of interest. The percentages were wrong. She blasted that. And then Representative Johnson, he, I wrote him a thank you note. He said, I am offended that you actually believe that we are of that mindset that we would not vote for a black person. I'm here to tell you, we have a police superintendent, he named them all, and he said, and I'm offended that you, that, that you think that that is what our mindset is. And he said, it is not like that at all. And he went on and on and on. So I wrote all of those people, thank you notes for having the courage to say, we know what this is about, okay? And it's simply untrue, okay? It is untrue that they, and, and he said, you can't vote for the candidate of your choice, really? Really? That Because they wanted another congressional seat to represent their interests. The, even the people that went up and testified at the end, it was ridiculous what they were saying, but it was fascinating because it's a very controversial subject. It's very sensitive, right? It's still, to this day, it is still a very, very sensitive subject. And it's simply not true that the majority of the people in Rapides Parish are so prejudiced that they have to redraw the thing. Anyway, it's, it's important that you pick whatever is of interest to you, either Follow that particular legislation because, as JC said, there's a lot, okay? There are a lot of means. <clears throat> Learn who your legislator is and build a relationship with them. I didn't even know who mine was a year and a half ago. I did not even know who my local people were. I didn't know who the mayor was. I didn't know. But now I see how important it is to get involved in that and go listen to a hearing and to <coughs> the mindset of some of the people who don't want to teach American history. I mean, Valerie Hodges had to bring in historians to say why it's important that our children learn American history. But you actually see people saying, why are you wasting the legislature's time? And she said, and Valerie Hodges said, because the school board is not doing its job. And everybody knows they're trying to teach CRT. But my, my point in saying this is I personally find it fascinating. Some people might say, oh, it's just so boring. There's nothing boring about it. It is fascinating to watch the back and forth. And it turns out that that particular day, uh, they, they lost and just because the judge said. Yeah, just plug it back in. Yeah. We're, we're, we're plug it in and put your stuff in. And luckily, my representative, Mark Wright, here in Covington, he got up and had the courage to say, I can't, I can't support this. And Stefanski, in the very beginning, said, the reason that I'm asking you this is because my constituents are going to ask me, why did you support this? I have to be able to face my constituents. And I found it refreshing that those politicians, those legislators, care about what their constituents think. And it, it renewed my faith in that, OK, if we pay attention, if we make our voices heard, we make our voices heard, it makes a difference because they care. Right? Can, can you tell the passion in her voice <laughs> and in the way she is? and went to Advocacy Day and watched it that I became totally, totally immersed in it. And some people might say, man, I don't want to go to the Capitol, but I've gone several times by myself, and I went to Susan five hours without food and water. 
Well, but what's, what's cool about what Janine is saying is that she found her niche. There's lots of niches out there. Um, I had the privilege of being able to have dinner with Dr. Douglas Frank and David Clem Dr. David Clements, two other election integrity people, and one of the things I told them that we're talking about in these Convention of States meetings is, it's our turn. Now we have to do something about it. Rush Limbaugh is dead. Donald Trump is no longer in the White House. We've got to get off the couch. Yeah. And that's what we're doing. And that's why we're here in this room right now. It's time for us to stand up. And it's happening. It's happening all across the country. And that's the beautiful thing about it. It's happening in this room. It's happening in other rooms around the state, Louisiana like this. And it's happening all over the country. It is happening in a way that, that has never happened before, frankly, that I've in my lifetime we gotta get in this country. We've got to get our friends involved. When you go home tonight, you've got to get people involved. But look, yeah. we're not the only ones on this journey. Right. It was a great segment this morning on Walton Johnson's show. <laughs> it was the Supreme's Greatest Hits. I don't know how many of you heard it. <laughs> no, but the first one, of course, was Dobbs versus Mississippi. Really? The second one was the, uh, the case in New York. Uh, where they, they overturned the gun control thing. But the third one was West Virginia, where they told the EPA to get a get new police on life because you're not going to be able to do what you've been doing. And you go on down the list. The tide, you can sense the tide beginning to turn because of the Trump appointments to the Supreme Court, that they are headed back toward original, originalism, which is where convention of the states wants to take us. But don't think that we can rely on the Supreme Court to fix it. The Supreme, even though we've got some good justices that have done some good things in the last few weeks, this is a process that's been going on for decades. The Supreme Court has been perverting the Constitution for decades, as far back as even before Roe v. Wade. Roe v. Wade was itself an abortion of the Constitution. Yes. There's nothing in the Constitution that gives the Supreme Court the authority to nullify state law on abortion. There's nothing in the Constitution that gives the Supreme Court the right to nullify state law on marriage or a whole lot of other things. So what, Mar what, what uh, Mark Levin would say and many other s legal scholars would say, we are now living in a post-constitutional America. The constitutional limitations on the federal government no longer exist because the court doesn't want it to. And the president doesn't want it to, and the Congress doesn't want it to. So what we're doing now with the Convention of States and the amendments is to enforce the Constitution as written. Amen. We're not trying to change it. We're trying to enforce it. And that's a big dang deal. And you're going to get some, some pushback on that. Well, I don't, want to, I don't want to change my Constitution. Well, we're not changing it. We're enforcing it. Remember, the Constitution was amended right after the Civil War. If you start hearing this stuff, that's how uh, slavery got abolished. That's how the... Uh, the uh, privileges and immunities lost by slavery were abolished and the right to vote were all returned in the 13th, 14th, and 15th amendments. So the Constitution as written today yeah. is actually in, against slavery. It has abolished yes. slavery, it's abolished yes. all, all the vestiges of slavery. Yes. So do, well, those people who tell you the Constitution is fraudulent when it comes to slavery are just wrong. They haven't read it yet. The point, Gail, is very well you know, they say you can't depend on the Supreme Court. The left has, has depended on the Supreme Court as a, as a legislative substitute for, you know, at least half a century. And, you know, they got comfortable with it. They're not comfortable now. You know, and we shouldn't get comfortable either. Right. You know, this, Never again. You know, the grassroots from the state legislature thought is the way to go. Fortunately, at least in our experience, and, and these two have more experience with the legislators than I have, um, they listen to you. They, they'll see you in the grocery store. They know that you're, you're their neighbors. They know that your kids may go to school with their kids. They will listen to you. They may not return your phone call that day. They may they not respond to your email immediately, you. but they will get back to you. And yeah, you talk to their assistants. They know that you're real people and you can have a real impact on them. You do it politely, you do it professionally, you do it pleasantly. They will listen. Most of these legislators are normal folks just like y'all, just like us. They got jobs too. They got businesses too. And, and so that's where we can have more influence and that's why we're creating these relationships with the local legislators because we're going to need them and they're going to need us when the time comes to ratify some of these amendments. Yes, ma'am. Secretary uh, Ardoin there said the same thing in the meeting. He said he feels the pressure. That's us, y'all. That's he did. us. He did. Yes. Yes. He did say that. He said the same thing and also heard from the governor. He, 
he does listen. He may disagree. Some things with too big, he can't override, but some things he is. But the thing we need to do is we need to increase our grassroots effort because this governor, if we could get 7,000 board strong, I'd like it to 2,000, I don't know. But we, if we could get up to 7,000 and 10,000, we could pressure him and roll over him now. Just for the record, we have over 30,000 people that have signed the petition in Louisiana. You can't get 30,000 people to do anything. So we, we've got an army, now we just gotta mobilize them and get them going. Yes, sir. Went to, we went to a, an instruction class, I don't know how long ago, about a, about a year ago, a, a national political consultant came in to teach about activism. And there was a, a COS representative in the, in, the, in the audience. And all day long, I guess, he taught about activism, how to become active, you know, how to be an activist for your cause and all that, how to elect people, um, how to get rid of people, how to understand who you're going to elect, what they stand for, and what are they going to fight for. And during the conversation, the COS representative told this consultant, who's been all over national news, that COS has 33,000 signed petitioners. And it stopped him in mid-sentence. And he literally was about to say, and he said, 33,000? You know, it really makes a difference. And that's what you just said. I write my, my congressmen. I write the state representatives. You know, so what? They don't, I'm no one. All right, Scalise, his office, his minions will call me. They will. But if they know that a block, not just one, a block, that makes a tremendous difference. So, I, you know, and I, we have discussions at home about this, and I'm not trying to dilute the COS message by any means at all. You know, if this goes to convention, that that's great. But there's so much more you can do in the meantime. And that's the important yes. thing. Well, and even, even Mark Meckler will tell you, the, the, one of the founders of Convention of States will tell you, that the purpose of what we're doing at COS is not to have a convention. That certainly is part of it, but it's to build the largest grassroots army of citizen yes. self-governing citizens ever in the history of our country. And that's what we're doing. And that's what you are. Because, you know, when we sit there and we look at, we're standing at the bottom of Mount Everest and we're thinking the convention's up there, whatever the height is, we're never going to get there. Right. But what these people do and what you do and what Janine does and every Susan and everybody in this room who is really active, and I'm not really active, but I come and I talk a lot. <laughs> you know, it, 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 it's very important that we bring real coordinated pressure to bear on our local officials. Well, and I always say that I'm not alone. I, I can't say, well, you know, this is something that COS um, supports. I mean, you can't do that. No. I can't do that. Right. But I always you make a point to say, I'm not alone. There's a lot of people I know who think exactly the same way, and we're organized. Keep in so mind that there are some selected legislation that, that COS in Louisiana has sponsored the last couple of years. Uh, it's been election integrity and it's been educational integrity, let's call it that. Morals. And the what? Morals. Oh, morals. Yeah, well, and, but that was part of the election, I mean, the educational stuff. We have to go through national in order to select the legislation that we want to sponsor and, and get their approval because we've got to make sure it's consistent with the self-governance principles of the, of the national organization. But that doesn't mean you can't, as an individual, go out and support anything you want. Can, can I say something here? It has to do with what Mike and, and I forgot to yeah. say. Yeah. Okay, what they were saying. Uh, when you when you write a letter, like right now, uh, I, I'm really upset with Cassidy. I'm sure I'm the only one in the room that's really upset with Cassidy. So I write a letter to Cassidy, but that's not as far as I go. I also I write it out on a Word document and I email it to Cassidy. But I also copy and paste it into my Facebook page and my uh, Getter account. And it passes around. So everybody who goes and looks at that can also copy and paste that and post it on their page or share. Yeah. And then that way it can go out with a lot more power than just each one writing in what's on their heart. Is there any point at all in letters to the editor of the newspaper? Actually, there is. Uh, I was actually the media liaison for a while for uh, Convention of States here in Louisiana, and I kind of gave up on it. I mean, look at the Advocate, look at the New Orleans papers, most of them. But, but there is, 
Yes, because that there is a communication level there, although few and fewer people are reading those. There is a, a role in doing some of that as well, I think. Yes, ma'am. What I do, everybody thinks I do all, most of my stuff in the Capitol. I really don't. I do all my stuff in the field. I don't contact the legislators. Well, I do the legislators, but I contact the constituents back home and share, share, share. We all know binary arithmetic. 2, 4, 8, 16, 32, 64, 5, 12. If you go 20 levels up, that's a million people. Just a 2 by 2. Two times two, two times two, binary arithmetic. That's where my power is. When I when I write, I say, please write your legislators uh, by tomorrow or something like that. And share, 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 and, and get your other people. That's where the power is at. It Agreed. gives them hope. And a man like you, I need to address. Is it Pierre? Yes. You are doing your part. <laughs> Everybody yes. is a different part. That's right. You gave up your wife. To come not to really. <laughs> you know, no comment. You know, every little bit counts. It's you get, it's it's easy. The ones increase faster than just one or two big numbers. You rather the the pennies accumulate. The ones on the bottom. That's where your power is. But Susie, if I can follow up on the media comment that he oh, made just course. a minute ago. No, you know, you're, no, you you're right. Um, there's a lot more media out there now than there was just a couple of years ago. Um, there's a lot more conservative media, including here in Louisiana, Jeff Cruer and all those folks on WGSO in New Orleans. We've been on there a couple of times. Uh, Moon Griffon over in Lafayette. Uh, there's the folks up in Shreveport. I'm, I'm losing their name right now. But there, and, and then there's so much independent media out there that you don't have to go to the newspapers as much as you used to, to be able to reach people because not many people are reading the newspapers. No, anymore. they're reading other places. So go to where those other where people are reading. Okay, just to keep things on track, by the way, people, we don't we only have this place at the o'clock, and I'm the sergeant of arms, and I just want to mention it. If I, one more quick question: What can I say in a letter to anyone that I write, any legislator? I say uh, I'm not alone in my opinion. How far can I use COS? What can I say about COS in my letter? Can I say that I'm a petition signer for COS? I don't have to make a connection, a frank connection, between what I'm talking about and COS, but I kind of like to be able to say I'm a member of COS, because they get that message. Yeah. They understand that, look, hey, this guy is sending this stuff. He's liable to send this out to 33,000 people in the state. They know who can I say? They're beginning to learn who we are. It's okay to say I'm a member of COS. What you can't say is that we're supporting a particular piece of legislation until we actually are able to pick a piece of legislation. Well, fine. So when I write to bitch about something, then I can say I'm not alone. You know, our, our COS, um, you know, we talk about these kind of things at COS meetings that I attend. Yep. I, I absolutely. Can you can say absolutely you can do that. Across. Right. Absolutely. Right. Keep in mind, it, it, if we're going to be supporting individuals, I mean individual legislation, it's got to be under the name COS Action. That's the 501C3, help me with that, 4, C4. Yeah, that's that's the political arm of, uh, of Convention of States. So, but yes, you can say I'm, in, I'm a COS person, I'm very interested in this, here's what I think. And Absolutely. No mention of candidates or parties. No, we cannot do that. Okay. And that's okay. Because at the end of the day, we're not really concerned with party. No, we're not. That's not what this is about. Uh, yeah, one, of, one of the crazy things I've been doing, I subscribe to the electronic version of the Wall Street Journal and the editorial page is where I hang out. And there's always comments, so if you can make, if you're a subscriber, you can add comments to the various issues in the Wall Street Street Journal. And and I've been tagging them, you know, when I talk about something the government's doing that's way out of line, say, and if you're fed up with this, look at www.cosactions.com. We've got about five more minutes, so we've got to start picking up. That's, yeah, awesome. You can do recruiting. Yeah, yeah. Which you want to put on? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but any any place that allows you to have a voice, you can always plug your organization. Right. I think JC wants to. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, we have yeah. about 15 minutes. Exactly. So uh, let me uh, kind of take off on what the uh, yeah. I, one of the th- big things that we're uh, we have we have to get things clear to, uh, through through the. Uh, all the way no. up the flagpole. So what we do is we'll meet and we go through bills and we'll pick a couple of bills 
actually I'm hoping in the future that we can do a few more. But two years ago, two years ago I think it was, uh, I met with the state director and because of my background in politics, I was a lot more involved with some other teams. And those teams don't, most of the people I was involved with just don't want to be identified because they work for companies and they work and, uh, and, and they really officially can't get uh, involved. When I worked for Loop, I officially, because I was in charge of controls, anything related to crude or power or anything like that, I couldn't take a position on. And it's a shame that you can't do that in this country. But now that I, I'm retired, I'm kind of free to you know, do my thing. But w when I first started with COS and realized the resolution was passed and I wanted to get involved in legislation, uh, I was first told that we don't do that. I said, okay, so you don't need me. I signed a petition and then the state director said, well, we'd like you to get more involved. I said, well, I'm confused. You want me to get more involved, but you said, well, I can't get involved in political. What do you want me to get involved with? I said, well, with, in, with COS. I said, yeah, but that's not my thing. My thing is actually working on legislation, trying to pull this country back. I don't understand how, how this is working, gonna work. So in the process, I got, I, I, cause I was gonna drop out. So I got called back and this, uh, uh, Susie called me and says, this is our, our previous state director. She called me and says, okay, we're, we're, gonna, we're gonna look at a couple of bills. I said, a couple's better than nothing. <laughs> so we got cleared to do a few bills. Now what has happened in the interim is I've met some people with, because of COS. But I've met people like Susie, and I've met some other people that I work with. And it's great because Louisiana Sunshine doesn't have the same restrictions COS has. So COS, we can feed stuff through them and work on bills. So there's an option here. So let's look at the election. This is the election bills we worked with, all right? The top four are the ones that we really cared about. We worked with Kyle Ordan on. And these bills were identified by the Secretary of State as the most critical bills that he was concerned about. You see the top bill? That's Zuckerbucks. That top bill is Zuckerbucks. That was the one COS had a call to action on. We had 800 and something people respond to that call to action. That got their attention. We lost that bill by one vote in the Senate. And that's, and that's a whole nother story. We don't have time to go over that because I want to go over a couple other things. <laughs> but bottom line is, those top three, uh, three bills were the ones that the Secretary of State were concerned at because Dale is on a committee to address hardware. The voting machines, the hardware. Those three bills up there address the actual uh, 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 the, uh, voting process. Zuckerbucks, uh, you know, money uh, influence coming in. Uh, Boyer's bill was a great bill. You know, 358, 359, we managed to get it through, governor vetoed it. The next bill is a great, I mean, uh, yeah, the, the, I'm sorry, the second bill was uh, Farnham's bill. That's a bill to audit the, the voter rolls. The governor vetoed it. The rest of the bills on here, well, uh, the, 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 the next bill, Willard's bill, was actually a bill, and, and Dale and I was sitting in the committee. That bill originally, wanted to set up curbside voting. Now, if you want to know what curbside voting is, that's basically mail-in mail uh, uh, drop boxes. That was in the bill. We managed, we, now Dale was there, we, would, we worked on it. That was an amendment proposed to take that out of the bill. Well, they didn't want a bill to pass with that, with that amendment on there. So it got transferred into what's called a resolution. Now. Do you want to stay involved? Of course, because it's now a resolution. Well, guess what happens with a resolution? They study the bill, or they study this resolution. Now, I guarantee you, if we don't pay attention, guess what's gonna go back into this resolution? Yeah. Curbside voting. I guarantee you this, if we don't stay abreast of what's going on here, cur curbside voting will sneak its way back into this resolution, because now it's a study. 
See, I, I guess, told you that this guy knows more about legislation than anybody else. So we, we, he does these sheets all for us all the time. Yeah. And look, the, the, you know, the rest of these, I'm not going to go through all these bills because we don't have time for that. But these bills are important. And these bills are not all bills that we like. Some of these bills are bills we don't like. Some of these bills are bills that were set up to actually do polling places and adding polling places. But we worked with Kyle Ardan on redefining these bills. And I'm going to give Kyle Ardan a lot of credit. A year from now, I mean a, a year ago, I was ready to campaign against him. When he told me he couldn't pull the RFQ back on the Dominion voting machines, I said, and I told him to his face, I said, well, maybe I need to find another Secretary of State. And he, you know, he, I did not realize that his hands were tied because of the way the, the because of the way his, the, 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 the law was written. And, and Act 480 untied his hands. Since then, Kyle and I buddies. I see, I walked out of my car Tuesday, and Kyle's walking up, and I said, oh, this has got to be Providence. We're walking up together. He said, you're not going to beat all of me. I said, no, sir, I'll beat you a Providence. Yeah, <laughs> well, but again, like Janine, you see JC's passion, you see his talent. <clears throat> Yours may be different. We've got even groups of people that just write Christmas cards for legislators, just to keep them in the way. So way. let's look at, the, the, you see these bills in yellow? These are the Senate bills. Senator Cloud's bill. Senator Cloud and I are buddies now. I would have known Senator Cloud before this, but Senator Cloud has been great. Senator Cloud has had a bill on absentee voting where they were filling out forms and they weren't completing them. They weren't putting the mother's name on it. They weren't finished signing them. They were a mess. They were, they were just letting them go through. They were bypass. So she had a bill to fix that. The governor vetoed it. Right? Any other questions? Any other comments? Anybody got anything else? No, I just wanted to ask. So Louisiana, they've never had curb uh, like drop. No, no, no. And to, well, we to, to, yeah. oh no, look. If if, uh, if that bill, if if the Willard's bill would have gone through with, with with the way it was originally structured, you'd have had it. There were rumors that there were some drop boxes in New Orleans, but Kyle Ardwin struck not out and said no. And in fact, some tried. Yes. And, they, and it, he stopped it from happening. Now, who is talking about the Senate? I mean, the, the, con, uh, the courts. Uh, Matt was, okay, so here, here, here's the stuff with the courts. So education, I don't know if you know who Don Bongino is. He was talking about the amount of money that goes into education. The amount of money that is spent on each child. Because uh, they did a take off. Wall Street Journal did this take off on education. They, they estimate that uh, $25,000 a year is spent on a child's it education. Says well, right, right, that's, that's for the whole... The whole. So the, this was from his show. He posts these kind of things. Now, I'm, I'm going to go through some of this pretty quick because there's some stuff here I really want you to see. And I know we've... We're, okay, so the First Amendment of the Constitution, who knows what the difference between the Establishment Clause and the... Free exercise clause. You know? Because that's why you can't have God in school. Because some wacko uh, uh, Supreme Court justice and some, uh, they decided we couldn't do this. Right? So they took the Bible out of school. The Bible. Okay? Now, separation of church and state. This is a ruling. Six to three. This opens the door to get the Bible back in school. It doesn't open it all the way. It only, it's, but if you go read the, the legislation, I mean, the, you go read the Supreme Court opinion, they left the door open. Not, it's not open wide. I don't want to get everybody excited. But there's a good crack there. School, school prayer, the one about the football coach. This is a 63 yes. ruling. Yes. This is a great ruling. These two rulings coupled together gives you a good sign of what we can do, right? So what's next on the agenda for education? Well, who's talking about Senator Cassidy? Senator Cassidy is one of three senators that have authorized this bill. This, the Civic Secure Democracy Act. Now one of the big things that we were concerned about, they weren't teaching civics in school. Well, true to form, the federal government says, you know what? We need to teach civics in school. But guess what? Guess what the bill, the goal of the bill is to take civic, uh, critical race theory and, civ and action civics in America's classroom. So they take something that the public is demanding. Let's get civics back in school. And they say, Senator K. 
Cassidy, yeah. Senator Coon, and Senator Cohen out of Texas decide, and these are two Republicans, yeah. they're going to authorize this bill. And you're thinking, wow, I really, and they want to know why I'm not a Republican. You know? Why I'm an independent. I don't like either party. And they pr can't keep proving why I don't like either party. All right, so this right here, this is the education bills that were, you see all the ones that I've highlighted? It says school choice. This is back in the legislature. This is back in the legislature. This is in Louisiana. This is the talking to representatives. There has been a tidal wave of attitude change in this last session. All these bills that I've highlighted are all school choice bills. And we've got their attention. And the last thing we want to do is let it go. This is wonderful. And the Supreme Court has been critical because I guarantee you, the Supreme Court rulings, if you're a legislator, you pay an attention to what the Supreme Court is saying. And it emboldens you to refile your bill. My representative had a bill where she wanted the money to go with the, the kids, mm -hmm. period. Representative Schlegel told me she was gonna file that bill. I said, well, girl, that's pretty gutsy. You're jumping off into no man's land there. She says, well, she says, I know, you, I, she says, I know the group you will, will back it. That bill never got off the floor. You know why? Yes. Because of what happened with Daughter's bill, with Harton's bill. 24 people came out, the, <coughs> came out the woodwork and talked against Harton's bill, and that cooled her off. We could do this for hours, yeah, but they're about to kick us out. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, everybody. So, for coming. Thank you all for putting this together. So y'all stay emboldened. The Supreme Court has given us a great reason to stay emboldened, and, it's, it, and our legislators are emboldened, and if anything, they want to hear from you. And, it, you, know, you know, like I said, you don't have to spend your life being involved in this. Just stay informed.